Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn in them with me to Romans chapter 8? We're in our series in Romans, and uh, God, is, God has really been good to us. We've, we're in this transitional moment, and chapter 8 is one of those, as we, we're into the, the problem portion, as we've described it, and we're coming out. He's, Paul is making this turn from talking about us being pathetic and pitiful and miserable and lost and without hope and to transitioning into some direction here where there is grace. And we pick up the reading in Romans chapter 8, verse number 18, and it goes like this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Everything that Jesus has, has been given to him by divine right and privilege. As a member of the Trinity, the Godhead, he is in perfect relationship and there is perfect unity and harmony and peace in the Godhead. This difficult idea of the Trinity, Paul addresses throughout the book of Romans, but it is one where we see that everything Jesus has, he has by divine right because he is God, as Paul clarifies earlier. And here, we also find that we have been imparted to because of divine grace, we have been given the rights as his children. So everything that Jesus has because of divine right, we have been given by divine grace. And we ju he just finished telling us that we're not condemned, that we're adopted as kids, we're his children because we're under his grace, and we learn that we're not perfect, but we are new. We are new, and that is a, that is a great thing. That you're not perfect, but you are new. If you're perfect, um, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're wrong. Um, just ask your spouse or anyone else that's close to you, and they'll tell you the truth. So some of us may say, Pastor, it's been a long time since I've been new. Well, I can appreciate that. Sometimes we don't feel new. It's been a long time since I've been new. Um, but in light of eternity, you are new. There's a long time from eternity past to eternity future, and the span in between is, is as endless as we could possibly imagine, even beyond that, as Paul says, and it's a very long time. So this is one of the benefits of grace. We might think that, um, we might think that we're old, but really we are new, and uh, I'm so glad for that because I tell you, sometimes I get up in the mirror, and I look in the mirror, and I say, I look not new. But Paul, but Paul makes a great promise here to us from God that we are new. So Paul, he, he brings a comparison here as well with our suffering. How many have ever suffered? Okay. Welcome to the human uh, race. We, ha we suffer. He spent a lot of time earlier talking about the significance of suffering. And, but, but here he puts suffering and he compares it to eternity. That, that is just not a fair comparison. He's, he takes the time to really uh, tell us that all the things that are happening to us right now can't even compare, not even close to eternity. He says that our present suffering um, is just in comparison to what's coming is not there. It's a lopsided comparison. There is none whatsoever. I mean, because our suffering sometimes seems so big to us, that's hard to fathom. How many have suffered real pains and hurts in life? We have suffered terrible things, and those things can weigh on us. Suffering, there's a lot of suffering issues in life. Our bodies suffer. How many know this? Our bodies suffer. Um, our, our commute is a suffering um, to work every day. Maybe some days more than a cold eggs. Okay? Um, I think about some of the things as Americans that we call suffering. Cold eggs may be one of them. I don't know. But I'll never forget being in Tijuana on a trip, a missions trip, and on the way down to the South San Quentin Valley, we went into this place for a couple of days into the, the, the trash, the dump. And uh, we took 50 deflated soccer balls, and we were going to go in there, and, and we were told there were kids there. So we had this guy from the church take us there, and we went to the dumps. a little sketchy getting there. I, tell you, I was like, God, I got a couple of handfuls of kids. Do I really want to come into this neck of the woods? Anyway, the things I do with your, your kids in the past, you don't want to know. <laughs> I took him into this dump, and we got into this dump. And um, when I saw the trash begin to move, and realized that that wasn't garbage, it was kids, I realized that my suffering did not compare. The things that I go through in life are, are of 
little consequence to what they do fighting for scraps every day. And I thought, God, how is this possible? But our suffering, we, we suffer genuinely. The death of a loved one, uh, mental anguish. And I don't think you have this in your Bibles, but 2 Corinthians 4.16, if you have an old-fashioned one with paper, that's great. If you have a fake one on your phone, you can use it. It's not fake. I'm just kidding. But if you have one on your phone, you can use that too. But 2 Corinthians 4.16, let's look at the, another perspective that Paul really brings to us here. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. If you consider suffering, if you and I consider suffering today, we consider God's promises also for us in eternity, right? How can we compare our suffering to eternity? And Paul puts these two things into place as our present suffering cannot even be compared. So the depth of our suffering, the, the, the darkness of it is as far as we can possibly think we could suffer. On the other side of the spectrum, there's not even a good touchdown pass you caught from the 50-yard line. There, there, there's not a prize you have won in this life. There's not amount of money that you could earn. There's not the pleasures of anything in this life that could possibly compare on the other spectrum of what you can imagine that the deepest, darkest place could be to be a comparison. It's just not possible. He says, beyond all comparisons. So compare those big things in your mind. It's not even in the same ballpark. It's not even like apples and oranges because they're both fruit. It's, it's not even the same. It's, it's, imagine your, your most favorite dessert you like to eat. I mean, mine is moist chocolate cake with, with wonderful, smooth frosting, lots of it. And I can imagine having that, compare that to, to eating dirt and worms. Maybe you like dirt and worms, I don't know. It's still not to be compared because I can still compare it. You see what I'm saying? Imagine a scooter and a Harley. I mean, scooters have way more power, but I, I'm just saying that it, the comparison, you know what I'm saying? And they're not even in the same ballpark. Paul says beyond all comparison. The problem is the trouble that we have in this life, our suffering gives us such a beating, doesn't it, sometimes? It really can suffer quite a beating. Some of you are still stuck on Harley. I, I can tell. It's like, <laughs> Pastor, how can you do that? I, I don't know. You can look up the stats and actually race one. You'll see it's true. But I'm just kidding. All right. Don't leave the church over the Harley jokes because they're going to come. It's going to be a plethora of them probably in the future. I don't know. But our issues in life serve us pain continually, don't they? They keep coming, they keep coming. It's, it's a nonstop thing. We live in a fallen world cursed by sin. And because of that, Paul says that the result of this is groaning. And I, groaning is, is a difficult thing. And one of the, the, the moments that I have realized groaning the most is when my children were sick. And I'm sure if you have children, you understand this. And you go in their room beside their bed, and the poor little guys are there, my boys, and they're laying in bed, and I'll never forget Justin specifically being very, he had to have a surgery, and he was in pain, and he was laying in his bed, and he was sleeping. And his whimpering and his sleeping, right? Just, uh, my heart is breaking. I'm like, I want to take his place. You know, I wish I could be him and just take that pain from him because, you know, he's my, he's my kid and he's, he's going through this terrible pain. And it gets worse as they get older, actually. Uh, they, they, you know, they become adults and then you whimper, right? I don't know. Um, it becomes more of a challenge. There's different groanings that they go through. And as a parent, you go, man, I wish I could take that for them. I really wish I could do that, although impossible. Every time I've watched them encounter the issues of life, there's been times that I've thought, man, I wish I could, man, I wish I could take that from them. But every single one of us groan. And I do that as a father because I have great, great desire for them. I love them, and I don't want to see them go through that. And then we know that going through life, we're going to have to go through pain and all this stuff to grow. But sometimes we don't want that. A loving father sees that it is necessary. 
In fact, he says creation groans. Look at verse number 19 of our text, Romans 8. He says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the a glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Now, when God cre created everything, what did he say? It is good. Right? It was good. It was all good. He sat back and said, nice. And to, you know, he rested on the Sabbath. He, I think he, had a, he has a big chair. It's probably called a lazy God. And he sits in it. With there, right there, and he goes, it is good, nice. I mean, I'm not putting words in God's mouth, but I can kind of see, you know, if that might be the case. But sin comes into the world, and all mankind, we're under sin, we're under this thing, and, and, and we're under decay and death. Because that's what happens when you die, you start to decay, and death is now the new normal. Uh, sin comes into the world, Adam and Eve, because of the fall. And it, it wasn't creation's fault, it was Adam's fault. It was mankind's fault. Now, creation itself is groaning. The Bible says the actual world, the physical earth, is groaning like it's decaying because of the curse of sin. Because it groans under sin. And it's waiting till we are renewed because the Bible says it's going to get a renovation as well. <laughs> uh, all the old earth has passed away, all the have new heaven and new earth, and God establishes it, and so we'll be forever with the Lord. So anyway, the actual world, though, is falling apart and because of sin. And sin is a weight that's destructive, and, and, and sin is painful, and sin is a curse. And the things that were created in perfection have been subjected to this disease. Verse 21 describes it as its bondage to decay. In other words, it's bound to decay. It's going to fall apart. The world, the physical earth, falling apart, decaying, coming to pieces at the seams. Bound for destruction is one of the translations uh, uh, reiterates it that way. And this is known as the second law of thermodynamics, right? There's no known ability to have complete entrop entropy. All ultimately comes into play where things cannot sustain themselves under their own power. They decay. They fall apart. They, 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 they can't stay powered functioning on their own. So it all deteriorates and they degenerate. And I, I know this personally and you do too because we've all looked in the mirror this morning and we know this to be true. We are under decay. My roof um, had become deteriorated more and more. And last summer I put a new roof on and it was subject to the elements, right? A roof just is. That's why you put a roof on, so it'll protect you from the elements. We have a new roof on our church. And what was happening to our roof here at church is that the sun and the rain and the wind and the snow and the ice and the elements that were beating down on it because of the extremes in the temperature and, and the moisture and the cold began to uh, create little uh, fissures, uh, separations of the parts inside the actual shingle. And the shingle itself began to become separated to a point where it no longer had cohesion. And then because it allowed a little moisture under there and the coolness and the dampness, some moss began to grow and other things began to happen. And after a while, it begins to push up a little from the bottom. And in the hottest of times, it'll all be okay. It'll conform. They'll last longer that way. But because it'll get cold in the rain and stuff, It'll start to get hard again, and then it'll get brittle when it wants to bend back the other way. And after a while, it breaks down. Not that you needed the technical lingo of that. But we see what happens, right? Everything on this planet falls apart. Diamonds aren't even forever. Everything falls apart. And the Bible says there is not one thing on this earth that we can take to heaven with us, except people. There's not one thing. We can't pack our bags. We can't. You heard the joke, really. Remember the woman who died? She, was, or the, she had a husband who died, and he died. And, and uh, his whole life, he kept all of his money, and he was really big into spending his money and keeping and saving and investing his money. And he said, honey, when I die, I want to be buried with all of my money. And he put it in his will and everything. And so she said, okay, whatever. 
So they, they go to bury them, they put them in the casket or when they put, you know, have an open grave and they close the casket and, the, and, and she gets uh, nudged by her friend standing next to her. Well, I thought he said that he wanted to be buried with Rolex. Where's all his money? She said, well, I wrote him a check. <laughs> so if you see if you can catch that, right? <laughs> we can't take anything with us. Perhaps the best illustration of this to get a mental picture is roadkill, right? Because it will decay. It brings death. Dead and begins to fall apart and little creatures begin to devour it. And this is what sin is doing in our world. The actual physical world is falling apart. The fact is that there's no stopping it. We're trying to stop it these days, but and, and there are a lot of lies about, uh, about the impact on, on the planet, and some of it's quite ridiculous. I mean, the, there's this war that we're always hearing about overpopulation. On some level, I so, suppose socioeconomically in certain dense populations, this certainly is true. But you can actually fit everybody on the planet inside this, the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida. So don't, have you been to Montana? I'm like... Uh, there are, the, the, it's so amazing. One of the things that is, uh, one study recently showed the, the huge progress that we're making in the lives of people around the world against hunger, that we've made great strides. And there's, it's not that everybody has been fed, don't get me wrong, but starvation is at a record low like never before in the history of the planet. Pretty remarkable. I'm not saying we have no impact, but the, the problem doesn't come from what we do, friends, it comes from what we have done, and that is sin. This world is going to die, and Paul describes it as suffering and futility. And, and we can recycle, we can drive electric cars, and stop producing farting cows, and stop using hairspray, all that we want, but this, the world is destined to decay. Sin has created entropy here, and it is breaking, breaking, breaking down. And it is the thing that is creating the world to fall apart. No matter what politicians say on the left or right, no matter what the progressives may say or the liberal arts student at the universities might say, sin is the problem. Sin is causing the decay. And the Bible says all of creation is groaning under it. I believe that's why the scripture talks in prophetically about, you know, weird coastal weather patterns and, and all kinds of things that the world begins to fall apart and, and, and all these things are happening to the actual earth because of sin. And then he says in verse 23, he talks about our groaning. He says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the, the first fruit of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of as sons, the redemption of our bodies. He points out here that we are part of creation and grown with creation under the weight of sin. We groan with creation under the weight of sin. The curse affects us in such a way that we have a longing we're groaning. We have, a, we have a desire to be free. And he de how he describes us, those who follow Christ, in the first part of the sentence, it says, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Remember, or do you recall when you first accepted Christ? You remember that joy and the power of that, that, that free feeling? It was transformative. It was God's power being on display in our life. And, and we accept the Christ, and hopefully you experience that still Every day as you meet with him, we accept him. We remember, do you remember though that feeling of initial repentance, of casting out all that junk and feeling the freedom and the joy that flowed in by the power of his spirit? That there was a real interaction from God to you, friends, and God to me. The uh, freedom of newness, a freedom, uh, a feeling that, that we were like, yes, uh, everything is new. I realize that Christ has changed my way of thinking and don't you remember that moment? I can't believe I used to think this way, right? And all of a sudden I'm going this way and I'm going like, what was I thinking? How could I have possibly? And then we begin to realize, man, this is great. That's because we've experienced the goodness of the touch of the Holy Spirit on our life. Remember that sense of joy. And now those that enjoy Jesus enjoy that ongoing sense of hope and anticipation of what's in store. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. 
That is God's work, affirming those things in our life. We sense hope now. We, we have a different perspective, a different outlook, and we have all these first fruits of the Spirit working in us. It's awesome. We, we can taste it. We can sense it. We, we have a revelation of what is to come, and, and that gives us motivation to press on, to keep going, because God has given us a mission in this world. The Holy Spirit gives us that a transformative peace and hope beyond what, what we know in the anticipation of more. He says in the last part of verse 23, we groan inwardly for the full reward of our adoption. We're groaning now, but one day we're going to have the full reward of our adoption. That we're no longer just aimless. Remember last week we, we saw how the Romans would cast out the babies if they didn't want them on the dung heap. And people would take them and they would raise them as servants and sell them as slaves or make them prostitutes and earn money off of them. And, and we've been adopted from that world. We've been taken out, given full rights as sons and daughters. That's the goodness of our God. I can't wait for the full redemption of our bodies. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Maybe I'll be 6'4 again. I was, I was once. You know. Well, maybe not quite that tall. Romans 8, 24, verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he sees? Well, nobody does because they already have it. Verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. If something's been given to you, you have it. You don't have to hope for it. The, the, the goodness of our God is that he is going to give us things that we can't see. There are promises. Remember the anticipation of a gift when you were a child? Remember their anticipation now for their birthday or, or a special occasion? And you give them a gift and, and there's an anticipation of what that is. I can't imagine that. Uh, being, you know, multiplied billions of times by a God who loves us so. The Holy Spirit groans. So we groan, and in verse 26, look what he says. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, there are two camps of thought on this. There's a literal meaning here, and there's a principal application that really gives, gives meaning. First, there is this amazing idea that the Holy Spirit is working in our behalf in the Trinity with God the Father and the Spirit to communicate in Jesus the meaning of what we, what we can't say but what we want to say. Have you ever been there? I mean, have you ever been to that place where it's like, God, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I, I'm so broken, and I, I don't have enough information. I don't know the answer. I, 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 God, I just don't understand. And we're so broken. We, he, he says what we can't. I've certainly been there, and this is a powerful truth that gives us encouragement. That when we pray, God knows. Friends, can you fathom that? That when you pray, you may not know how to say what's in your heart, the things that are in your mind, the things that, are, that confuse you, but God knows. He can discern what is going on inside you, and the Bible says he prays in that way in your behalf. Hey, we can't extrapolate the meaning, but we give this God our mess and he goes yep I know what you have to I know what you said I know what you're saying and I can comprehend it and I'm going to work in your behalf Hebrews 4 15 says we don't serve a God who doesn't feel right that he is touched with the feelings of our weaknesses aren't you glad for that I mean that we serve a God that identifies with where we are the things that we are facing that's one thing secondly there is this principle of groaning here that we are in partnership with the Holy Spirit, praying for things and do, interceding for things that God wants us to, right? That he has in mind for us to do some work here. That the groaning is actually the ministry of groaning. 
And that we are partnering with God in this mission in the world. And we are saying, God, do your thing through me. Lord, uh, we ask you for this. We pray, Lord, for that. We know that you can do this. And we humbly come before you and we begin to pray. And what happens? The Holy Spirit becomes our partner. We can't articulate it. And friends, there are those moments too where we're with us in the first one that we have such grief in this world. We suffer grief. I mean, you know what grief is like, right? I mean, if somebody has a child that dies and you say, how are you feeling? And, and they're just like, I, they don't know. There are no words. You're going through a divorce. How are you feeling? I, I, I don't know. The grief. And you know what God does? I'm so grateful. He prays through us. I hope that you understand that this is the ministry of groaning and groaning is not... A, a terrible thing. Friends, I hope that you can see it as a wonderful blessing that the burden for groaning is a purpose for God in your life. That groaning is the thing that He wants you to come to that altar and begin to pour out your heart and say, God, I don't know. I just can't articulate. I can't say. I, I haven't the words. I, I'm not in cahoots. I, I, don't, I can't figure it out. I, I just don't. And being in that place, there are such moments of grief that, that we can't explain. And, and those are the things, and this is necessary, friends. This is the ministry that God has called us to. You. He has called you. He has called all of us. You remember that song? I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear my burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus will help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus. The reason, there's a reason for the groaning. He says, the groaning in this world has a purpose in our life. That the ministry of groaning and the, the, the parts of our life of groaning and the purpose of the earth and the world groaning has a reason. There is a reason behind it, and God says there is. Paul writes about it right here in verse 28. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. The most misquoted scripture in all the world. Verse 29, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, I want to get back to this idea in just a moment, the reason for the groaning. But there is... A train wreck about to happen here. There is a nuclear explosion that some of you have been anticipating as we're coming across this verse in our expository sermon series. You're like, what is pastor going to say right here? Right, Casey? You knew it was coming. <laughs> Being raised good Assembly of God kid, Church of God, Assembly of God, you know, Trinity theology, predestination, Calvin, Arminian, you know, of all the theology nerds, you knew this was coming. So here's the nuclear explosion with the words that he uses. Those, those he foreknew, he also predestined. 
So images pop up with John Calvin in our head all of a sudden, right? We're like, oh, no, we're ruined. What are we going to do? We don't know what to say. Well, let's briefly deal with it by turning to John 6.35. And I really, I mean, you need a few hours, right? But here we go in like 10, 20 minutes. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, notice that, shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Uh Uh-oh, we're in trouble now. Verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should uh, lose nothing of all that has been given to me, but raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus says that twice. These verses are really some of the most powerful in all of Scripture for a few reasons, but not only do they contain the gospel and the message of the gospel, but they detail God's plan. They, they talk about his will. In fact, the term will, he uses that over and over again, talks about his will and his people. So the Bible gives us two perspectives here. I want to use the word perspectives, one being divine perspective and one being human. Okay? Um, so let's just use the Bible rather than the five points of Calvin and five parts of Arminianism just to say the one thing, Arminianism was first, and it was presented um, and was rejected as the theology for the the Reformation Church of, um, not Scotland, but, well, you know, Dort. So it starts out with man has a free will. God has given them, everyone, that free will, and because God knows everything from the future, God can look back and know that in their faith they chose him. Okay? The other first point of Calvin is pretty strong, the total depravity of man. I mean, that's it. It's just free will, total depravity of man, right? But the thinking for the theological principles are really both here. Some people say, well, you know, you can't have um, this you know, limited election and um, unlimited election or limited atonement and unlimited atonement, meaning that there is a little grace given to everybody, just God's given everybody just enough faith to believe him when the Bible says that God is the one who actually gave you the faith in the first place even to believe. What do you do with that? But the two perspectives are interesting because there's a divine perspective here, and it's characterized with Jesus talking about I will. He says himself, the will of God. He uses the word will here. I have to do the will of my Father. This is the will of my Father that everyone who believes in me will have eternal life. And the mind immediately goes to 2 Peter 3.9. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Better said that it is not God's desire that anyone should perish. He's not wishing, some translations, that any should perish. Um, But we always have to do the STOP, right? What's the situation of Scripture? What's the type of Scripture? What's the object of the Scripture? And what is the prescription? So this, from 2 Peter, is writing to the scattered church. He's writing to persecuted Christian people. Jesus says in John 15 that we did not choose him. He chose us. When my sons were little, especially the squirrely one, Justin, I would hold his hand in the parking lot strongly because he was just a squirrely bird dancing everywhere and, you know, he just wanted to go every way. And, and I, as a father, knew that that was not going to happen. It was in my mind that the best for him was going to be that I would hold it firmly. And not only would it defer him from going what direction he wanted to go, but it would keep him safe 
so that later in life he would be able to walk on his own. This is the image of a loving father. So don't think about it in Calvin and Armenia. Don't think of it in terms of, of fundamentalist churches and, and uh, you know, maybe Pentecostal, charismatic, or evangelical churches. Think of it in terms of Bible, right? That Jesus says this. In Romans 3, we learn that we are totally wicked, continually evil all the time. And that it is God who saves us. Then in the scripture, there's the human perspective. And this is exactly what he says, that people come to Jesus. This is human responsibility. In verse 37, all the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I won't cast them out. So the Bible says, whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved, right? That's what it says. Are we called to go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone? Yes. Uh, does John 1, 2, 2 say that he is the pre propitiation for our sins and not only ours but for the whole world yes it does say that does Titus 2 11 say for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for just the ones I picked no it says for all people so it's not worth the debate does God know yeah do we know no does God want people to be saved yes are we called to share Christ yes is that enough? Yes. Praise God settled. Not really, but anyway. So let's get back to the reason. Verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So here it is, friends. And I said misquoted earlier in the Bible, but the equation is not simply that God is using everything in life, and I hope you hear this today from, from my heart. I believe what God is speaking to us, that the equation is not simply that God is using everything in life for my good. It is that God does this for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. So that would result in groaning, apparently. Because there's a lot of things that I groan over because I'm in a sin-filled, sin-sick, fallen world that God does not take from me or solve for me. I am still here. How many have been told that because you're a Christian, you should always be joyful and smiling? Come on. I know you're in the deepest, darkest pit, and you're supposed to be sad, but God wants you to smile. When God closes the door, look for a window. The joy of the Lord is your strength. God doesn't want you to be sad. Have you ever read Lamentations? I mean, that guy is pathetic. And they would misquote things, you know, and greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. It doesn't mean you're not supposed to groan. It says that God will give you strength in that. I, I mean, I mean we went, he, Lamentations, a sad dude. The scripture says also to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Jesus rejoiced and Jesus wept. So we can express our human emotions in the spirit. Paul ha had an ailment. He calls it his thorn in the flesh. And he groans, his flesh groans. And anyway, it was some sort of physical malady. And, and he always, he prayed three times, he says, and seems fairly earnestly that God would just take this pain in his sight away. And, and God didn't tell Paul uh, th that okay I'll fix it and everything will be fine he says no my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in your weakness groaning all things working for good who's good that's another thing when I look at the word good in the Bible I often want to raise up my human intellect understanding knowledge and ability and say well it's the things that I think are good that's what culture does. They align things that they think are good, and they created this whole law system about it, and wokeness and all this stuff, and they can cancel you or push you out and do all this stuff because they've created their ideals based on their human intellect and ability and what they think. And so that, that's the definition, right? And the whole time says, wait a minute, I've got a meaning for good. And everything God says is good no matter what I think. I can think this or that. Or I, I can think that, you know, shacking up with my, my boyfriend or girlfriend before we get married is, is good. 
I can think that getting drunk is good. I can, I can think that uh, I can do whatever I want is good. I'll just take a little of this. I'll just say a lot of that. I'll just do whatever I want in this world. I'm just, this is all good because culture has defined it for me. Culture has said these are good. I'm going to go over and have seven or eight beers with my buddy. Then I'm going to drive home and hope I don't crash into anything. Because the world says this, this is normal. This is good, and the definition for good, even my good, I define a lot of things as good that some people don't. I think everybody should ride motorcycles. It's the answer to all problems. I think everybody should be married. There isn't much that my wife's body can't heal for me. I think a lot of things... But see, if I were to write a book and say, everybody obey this, but I can't because we wrote a book about God inspired by his Holy Spirit and he reveals himself to us and he defines goodness. He is good. He is the highest above good. Not just one triumphant word, holy is God, but three times the most, pro, the, the most pronounced word that could be an exalting term for any being of any kind. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. He's beyond comparison to me. God says he is good. So if all things are working for good, remember they're working for God's glory, even though you didn't want them to go home so early. Even though we may not understand the gravity of the pain that we're groaning through right now. I want you to hear this, friends. I know this isn't one of those sermons where we're going to jump up and down. Remember last week, we're all jumping up and down. Woo! Praise Jesus. This is one of those, I think, where we have to stop and say, okay, God, whose good is being worked out here? My good or your good? You know, that's the clash. Because sometimes I have to say, okay, God, you're working for my good, and that's the purpose for the groaning. The purpose, why all things? This is it right here, because we are becoming like Jesus. Those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed. We want to have all these theological debates about predestined and foreknowledge, but really the word here is confirmation. To be conformed to the image of his son. To be like Jesus. That's, that's the image, right? That's why, we, well, that's why we groan, right? And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you will have trouble in this world. Sin always forces the issue of decay and death and you, friends, are the agents of life. The word conformed always takes our mind to chapter 12. Don't be conformed to this world, but what transformed by the renewing of our mind. We've been wearing all of us masks for two years. Well, some have. I haven't. And we understand the threat anyway of a virus that can spread, that can cause sickness and death. I haven't always worn a mask. I'm not an anti-mask person, though. Don't take that away from here. But we understand the threat of it, right? We understand that it can do terrible things. And sin is the virus that we're walking around with. And this sin virus, the air that's breathing in, is, it's all around us. And we still live here, friends. We live in this sin-sick, fallen world. We're still, on this, we're still on planet pagan. We still live here. We're still subject to the death, the pain, the temptation, the plagues that affect our bodies, our mind, our speech, our actions. It all does this, and that's why we groan, right? Because we know that, that one day, just as Jesus was raised from the grave, so too we will be raised from this life or from this death. From this persecution, salvation, and the Holy Spirit's deposit in our life right now gives us real life and a picture of what, a glimpse of what it is beyond this dark world. Praise God for that. That's what salvation does. But it is only a picture of what he has planned for us. You know, in verse 21, what is it that the glory of God would be revealed in us? What a joyful thing. The illustration here is one of childbirth and pregnancy. He uses the word right there, the pains in childbirth, the first trimester, right, ladies? What's that like? Blech. The second trimester, you're glowing now, kind, kind of. 
the third trimester. <sighs> for some, different for others. And I've been there for five children being born, one of which was not from my wife, but from a gal. Oh, but that was interesting. Her husband was deployed. I don't ever want to do that again. Whew, boy. Lord, forgive me. I was young. But the birth and the birth pains and the, I am so glad I'm not a woman. Just, <laughs> right? Now, the baby is born. And there's joy there. And the husband all gets excited. He's like, oh, let's do it again. I mean, he's going to be in the morgue, right? <laughs> like right then. But I'll tell you, about six months later, she's like, let's do this again. She's like, let's do this again. The joy of childbirth comes with a lot of pain. And Paul equates the illustration here to that pain, that groaning. I'm going to ask those guys to come, Terry and your men. Now, as my fa as a father holding my kids for the first time, I and I'm sure you did too. I mean, they were perfect. But there may have been a crooked toe. There may have been a birthmark. There may have been a unique likeness to the father, which may not have been so welcome. It's a joke that was not supposed to go over so poorly. But, <laughs> but what else would a father and a mother say? Man, they're perfect. I remember one time we had a family in our church, wonderful family. For a long time, he played piano, and one of their sons was born without a hand. And him and uh, my oldest son became best little buddies in the nursery, and he would always be playing tricks, and he'd always, just, you know, I don't have a hand. Because his parents just made it normal. In fact, he stuck it in the fan once in the nursery in the grill, and he started screaming just to be funny. But if you were to ask Tim or Lindy what they would think of their son, they would say he's perfect. You and I aren't perfect, but we are new. The groaning in life produces new life. Joy comes in the morning. Laughter comes from more. Joy comes after trials. You may grow now, but life is coming, and it comes through the groaning. God has a purpose for your groaning, and I hope today that you don't push that aside. But you allow his Holy Spirit to let you walk through that. You may be grieving and groaning for a son or daughter. You may be groaning because of a broken relationship. You may be groaning for the weight of sin that you can't seem to break. But your groaning with partnership in the Holy Spirit has in mind for you. for watching Abundant Life Church. If you found this teaching helpful, please subscribe to our page and share us with a friend. Also, please consider giving at nwlife.org.